Hi, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, um, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Ken Toon. I work in the solution architecture team at Aerospike, and I'm very pleased to introduce today Stephen Price, uh, development lead at G Research. Stephen has nearly 20 years of developing in the financial sector under his belt, and I've had the pleasure of working with him over the last two years. He's going to be talking to us today about how G Research have made use of Aerospike and its complex data type API in particular in order to build a very fast time series database supporting point in time lookups. He's going to be taking us through the nuts and bolts of what time series data is and the technical challenges when working with it at scale to tight SLAs. He'll also be discussing the practical aspects of building such a solution on top of Aerospike, leveraging the experience of having had the application in production for every year. Good to have you with us, Stephen. Over to you. Hello, and um, yeah, I'm most in Price. I work in the data engineering group of G Research. G Research is um, a, the leading quantitative finance research firm, and you can read this yourself. But it, essentially, the engineering team is actually the core, one of the core concepts of the business, and we build some software and we're allowed to find innovative solutions to complex problems and explore new ideas. So um, data is everywhere, it's growing, it's um, constantly increasing and it's one of the biggest challenges. And time series data is becoming much more prevalent. And time series simply is data that varies over time. So in finance, there are many different types of time series. So just a couple of examples, when you think about investment data, we've got daily close prices, and there's like economic indicators such as employment uh, rates and um, interest rates and all sorts of different things. And it's just growing exponentially. And every day almost, a new time series is starting to appear. So the big challenge for engineers is how to efficiently store and retrieve this data to get this data out and, and just make use of it. So at G Research, we use data in two, time series data in two main ways. The prime one way is in research. So in research, the quantitative analysts look at historical data to explore trends, extract features. And in this area, anytime we delay getting data to them, waste compute time. And that is something we just never want to do. We want to get them as much information we can. And if we change the data, so say we improve the data or we find an error, but that data cannot be exposed to the research until they've completed their research because they're research based on those numbers. And we also want to make sure that we can get it faster than so they get fast feedback loops and they can understand exactly where they can, their research can lead them in different directions very quickly. We also use the data in live systems. The live systems, we use time series data to fine tune the way systems behave. And delays in getting them started can cause some really important problems because if the system comes up late, it might not actually enter into a market on time. And therefore, things can go wrong. The client would be you know, taking a lot of risks. We need to make sure that the data gets there and the time pressures to get that data to them is really high. And as we've put more and more data in the system, we need to get more and more data to them as quickly as possible. So both the challenges here require speed and reliability. So we wanted a system that can handle this and bring on whatever the future will bring. So we wanted a system with a lot of requirements. The aim was to build a system that's scalable, ideally limitless horizontal scalability. We wanted to act as a system of record to reduce the distance from the creation and production of data to where it's consumed. So that's the real key of getting it, reducing the complexity of the system entirely. We wanted to go to petabyte scale. We don't want it to sit there and go, this cannot go any further. It needs to be resilient. We want zero dying time. With the way that exchanges and markets are behaving and the way that systems want to be on all the time, we wanted a system that would match that even better than most of us. Ideally, we want it replicated to multiple active sites, not just DR capabilities, but active, active across the, across the globe. The performance, which is you know, one of the key things which Eris might talk about, we needed low latency and high throughput. We need both of those aspects. So how do we get a time series in a key value store? It's something that you know, doesn't quite fit, because you've got one key. Well, the way we do it is we use chunks. So a time series, if you can imagine, carries on for, for a long period. And one of the things we do is we chunk it, for example, into months. So you can see the time series for January, February, March, and each chunk is then stored as a unique 
uh, key with the whole data for that month stored as a value. So you can imagine you can query between two timestamps and combine it all back to one. So if we query between two dates, you might bring back a little bit more data and have to discard it, but that's relatively small problem in the, in the way the systems work. And the idea of having it in chunks means we can read it serially from one chunk to the other, or we can read them all in parallel and reinstate and reinflate that time series back to the way we want it. Okay, so what was the point in time about? Well, as I mentioned briefly, sometimes we improve the data, sometimes we might find an issue with the data. So what we want to do is to be actually be able to change the actual uh, time series. So we want to go back sometimes and we find a better source of data and more granular data, but research needs to be fixed. We need to make sure we keep giving the research team the same data every time they run their research and analysis. That's so that their research is just built upon solid foundations. But in the live systems, we need to deliver to them the current best value that's available. So we need to make sure that the current value is available to those systems. So as I mentioned before, the live systems have really fixed deadlines. They have to be available. So the bias on the system would be to be able to get the current value out as quickly as possible. So when it comes to this sort of technology about uh, point in time accuracy, there are two general, generally two ways of doing this. We can snapshot and take a copy of the data so the researchers just work off a copy, or we can use temporal versioning so that we can then say at this point in time, what is the version that's available? We all know that temporal version is more cost effective because you don't have lots of copies of the data sitting around. We don't have lots of infrastructure to manage and there's not as much administrative headaches, but how do you make that performant? And that's the key thing. We wanted to make a system that would be efficient, scalable and performant. So the next bit, I'm gonna do a bit of a deep dive into what temporal version is about. And then hopefully you can keep up, but just bear with me, it might be a little bit too quick. So, here we're actually talking about a single temporal version so it's unual temporal version we just like um, a simple time travel what is the weather like outside my window yesterday and always give the same value every time and the value that's written in is stored until the end of time uh, i'm sorry <laughs> stored until it is replaced so as you can see in the little example picture we had a time series and it had a gap and we found some more data and we fixed it up then we got a bit more and then we did some corrections so you see time if we ran this, the research at any of those times, you needed to return back that entire time series valid at that single point in time. So a lot of people teach this at universities using the from and the until, so it's really easy, you know, something it, between these two dates, that's the, top, that's the version we want. But you can do this with a single version timestamp. So valid from is really easy to understand. You depend a new record valid from this time, and you just read the one which is the one which is valid during the time you're looking for. Valid until is a much less obvious solution, uh, but that's just one of the simple, one of the things I want to try and do because this is what we actually implemented. So in this case, up until the first value is inserted, there is nothing, it's empty. Then when the value is inserted, that is valid until the end of time. It's a Bit of a weird concept but it allows us to be able to, to know that the current value at the end of time is the one which you need to give the live systems so it's really quick and easy to understand how that works the picture hopefully shows the same data in the previous slide but i always think of it in the map and i'm an engineer and i often look at this in the way in the map so this is the way that i see the data if you can see we do get by key for the infinite value and we'll get the time series which is currently value valid and if we do a, a get by key range we can get back all the ones which are greater than that uh, point in time so they know they're valid beyond that and the first one is the actual value we're looking for at that point in time so we see those those features of, of Aerospike cdt allow us to get to those things quite quickly for our use case we expect a very low number of versions so reading about the extra data wasn't really something we were really concerned about but those features allow us to get straight to that data. If you're doing this with um, uh, valid from, we'd have to find the first value and then we'd have probably iterate through all the keys. It's not as efficient, but this allows us to do it very efficiently. Now, the key bit that's really, really exciting or I find with the CDT is that when we do the insert, we have to do a little bit more extra work. What we've got to do is we've got to take the current value and put it at the point in time now, because now that one is becoming no longer valid. 
So we have to take, we have to do an update, sorry, an insert and an update. And we want to do that within one single generation. And again, Aerospace brings visibility with a single operate core. We can atomically do the insert and update and we get an idempotent change and it just works. It's, yeah, it's great. And as I said, the, the, doing this extra work during the writes just is um, outweighed by the amount of times that we read this data back. So it's a bit of a, a complex system in the way that we store the data. It's chunked, it's in versions, and we try and make this move around. But the bias here is to always be able to read the current value as quickly as possible, which is a single map gap. Okay. So while we were working through our selections, we looked through different types of technology and we reviewed many different things. We got that long list at the start about the demanding functional requirements we wanted the system to achieve. And also the when we bring technology into our organization, we want to make sure it fits in with the enterprise authorization authentication and the security. We want to ensure that encryption at rest and in transport is always built in the box. Our strategy was to use a vault uh, for a security. So we wanted to make sure that the vault plugin was available, something that some engineering teams here at G Research created, and that's something that's available uh, through the community. The platform also has to work in a polyglot environment. Um, the teams at um, G Research are all autonomous and they can pick and choose the right technologies. So you've got C Sharp, F Sharp, Java, Scala, Kotlin, Python, Go. You've just got a long list of technologies and uh, programming languages. And as you can imagine, we need something that can be adapted to work in many of those different ways. We also wanted to take on a technology that was proven to be worked in mission critical systems. We didn't want something that was novel and we could, you know, <laughs> and had to learn a lot to make it work really well. Okay, so now um, I'm going to talk through a little bit about what we did to get it into production. So in the organization, we worked as a multidisciplinary team. We had people from the infrastructure platform teams and many development teams. And it's an overlooked aspect, but the platform team created for us an internal platform as a service. So they worked with the, um, the, the Aerospike team to explain what we try to achieve. So we built Ansible scripts and monitoring and all sorts of other things I, I don't know about. And um, that's there. And it was something we made use of a lot. And it helped us move between different types of backing data disks and things. Again, stuff which is really sort of those guys knew. <laughs> The development team built upon existing abstractions in the application stack. So we knew the, um, the entry points for this data to go into the systems. And while we we're doing that, we created a few little novel data structures to help improve track the lineage and traceability of the data. So we knew where it came from when it was generated and whether it's been changed at any point. So with all this going on, we worked with many different teams and we had to get lots of help from the project management team just to coordinate things and ensure that everything lined up and we delivered reasonably well on time and make sure everything went forward. The biggest challenge that we found was migrating the data. The legacy system was the live system. So it was a bit careful. We could read some data out, check that we had an effective production, take some more data, take some more data. And it's a lot of incremental changes to make that data move across. It took some time and we did it carefully and we migrated everyone over. The big switch over day, switch over day came and everyone was amazed in lots of ways because it just worked we did get it all together in this in the, in the time so the business benefits from it was really realized by the speed of access the the old system as i mentioned briefly was a bit temperamental if you try to read too much data out or you try to change too much data there was always a bit of a hold, you know, holding holding <laughs> holding your breath just in case it wasn't going to work we you know we it, it did its job and it was you know, perfect for what it was doing, but with the growth in the amount of data and the growth in the quantity of this granularity, we just needed a new change. So now bringing new data into production and into onto the system is just task of hours rather than weeks. We can bring it in a new type of time series and, and it just, we can pour it into the system without any real panics. <laughs> It's also assisted by the, it's now got real horizontal scalability. So we need to add any more storage. We can just expand as we require. With the data access now being fast and easy and so many people being able to get more eyes on the data, we've now added the novel traceability so we can see where the data came from. People are reviewing the, quant the quality of the data, where it came from the best available source, where it wasn't, um, 
accidentally calculated incorrectly, or there was bugs in the decodes of those times. And we've also improved the courage gaps where we just missed it. We just passed it by because we were rushing or the system needed to be up. So the data is just, there's more of it and it's better. We're now truly, really running a multi-site active active deployments. In the legacy system, the secondary site was, you know, sometimes a little behind and didn't always arrive and switch on at the right time. But now they're all virtually at the same time, which is great. And also the great benefit here is zero downtime. Um, when we do an upgrade of the OS or of the actual uh, Aerospike instances, we don't have to plan ahead and work out the, the best time in the day, in the week, in the month, when that downtime can happen. Now we don't have downtime, so it's just seamless and easy to get things deployed. Okay, so after a year, well, it just works. <laughs> I have to forget it's there. So it's very simple. A lot of teams now have um, no longer concerned themselves about where the time series data is. In the in the previous with the legacy system, they knew a lot about its idiosyncrasies, the way it behaved, when it was going to be a problem, when it wasn't going to be a problem. So now you ask them, they just, just say, oh, it's an error spike. They don't need to worry. It's so good. Um, as I mentioned before, the rolling upgrades and zero service interruption is something that we just hadn't seen before. It's great because now if anything happens, we can just, just make upgrades, change, and everything else. We are also interacting with the data in new ways. As I mentioned before, we've gone through quality and coverage and improving the quality of the data, things that people never did because it was just so hard to get into the data. These people are working with in different ways, you know, different notebook systems, different technologies have been brought in because we can get to the data now. We can get to it a lot quicker, a lot easier, rather than using it the same way as before. We're now using it in different ways. And since it came, we started to move to Aerospike, we've doubled the different variety of time series data we've got. Because we can bring stuff in, it's just allowed us to just say, oh, let's put that in there, let's put that in there. Let's just bring the new data in. So when someone wants to, to um, derive some new data from it, rather than having to go, what's the business benefit? It's gonna take months to re-engineer this. We can just pop it into the system. The point as well I forgot to mention sometimes is that we use this as a system of record and a system of engagement. The distance from writing the data to reading the data or having the data be able to read is now so compressed. It's just instant, you know, basically instantaneous. We write it in and it's available in both sites. So now we've been on the platform. There's lots of happy people and the systems are working. Most people have forgotten we did all this work. And now we're working with other teams to try and explore different use cases, places where we can use Aerospike to adapt. It's, um, it's a, as with autonomous teams, we have to show the benefits and explain how it works. So a lot of people are inquir making qu inquiries of how they can best make use of the technology. Okay, so hopefully I've given you a brief explanation of how we built the system and how it works. And um, thank you for, uh, for listening. So uh, thanks very much, Stephen. Um, so I, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I definitely picked up a few uh, new points today and you know, I've been working with you for two years, I think it is now. Um, not everybody who listened to the talk will be familiar with time series databases. So I think that um, it will have been you know, pretty informative to the, the newcomer and the, and, and the expert uh, alike. Um, Okay, so we've got a few um, questions in the chat. Uh, so let me kind of fire those at you in, in no particular order. Um, so the, the first one, and it's, it's, a, it's a good question and it hadn't occurred to me previously, um, but you know, there are in the kind of database taxonomy, um, a number of databases that specifically position themselves as time series databases. I, KDB is the one that I'm most familiar with. Um, and obviously, you know, if you were going to do a time series implementation, the natural tool to reach for would be a, a time series database. But, you know, you, G Research, chose not to do that um, for this deployment. I wonder if you could sort of talk us through um, your reasoning. Yes, Ken, that, that, is, that is a good question. Um, it's one that quite a few people sort of ask a little bit about. In... in, in 
the, the best way to, to think about it is this is biased really towards the read performance. And what we found is that time series databases are great at getting in um, sparse data really quick and getting back uh, small amounts of data really quickly. But this was to get back large quantities of data. So we actually store the values in a very compact format, which is the key thing. While with time series, you always have to store the time. So this is removing a lot of those elements as much as possible to get the payloads as small as possible. Yes, you could say it's a bit of an over-optimization, but um, every little bit of data on the read side really gas is, is, is the driver for um, the way we designed the system. All right, that, that's interesting. So I remember um, sort of early on when I first started working with you, you said that the organization was kind of obsessed with compactness and we have our own sort of compression capabilities, but I think you so sort of went way beyond that and you kind of compressed your data to like 10% of its original footprint. So um, I guess that, yeah, I, I, I can definitely make sense of that. And you have much more control, I guess, using a, using a key value database. W would you agree with the statement that, you know, the key value databases are not necessarily distributed systems as well? And I guess working at the scale that you do, it's imperative to have a distributed capability rather than one that runs very successfully, you know, on a, effectively on a single server, but won't necessarily diversify successfully. That's true. I'm not a time series database expert. Um, so, yeah, the distributed reliability, the additional throughput for having much more processing nodes is, was key to get this data out in parallel to as many places as possible. So that, yeah, that's something I hadn't considered. <laughs> I just always always sort of go to what distributed system as, a, as my go-to sort of technology for these sort of things. So. Well, it's interesting. Um, and, you know, we've got a number of people in the audience, some of them will know Aerospike well, um, some of them not so well. Um, so thinking of those people in, in particular, you know, most of us have grown up with relational databases and that's um, the first tool that you, that you turn to when, when storing your data. Um, I, I wonder, you know, could you talk about your experience with working with a key value database rather than a relational database for storing time series data? You know, was it, was it an improvement? Was it you know, an adjustment of your set? How, how was it for you? Yeah, key value database. Um, the the key difference that when we work with one, or we I've already found it previously, is that it's it's quick. And the quickest way to make it work is to use a way of generating the keys. So instead of trying to query the key value store, um, you try and optimize to get straight to the value you want. So that's why you often see me using maps and dictionaries because that's the way that I often sort of use this approach. Um, so calling a key value store for something and finding it's not there is sometimes quicker than running a general query to scan all the data. Um, those optimizations are, are available and you can make that work. But it, when it gets to that really fast way of getting data, if we can go this product this month, bam, get the data, you, you, have, you avoid any scans, you go straight to the data you want. And it could be, as you say, on any node in the cluster. Do you feel it's sort of more intuitive or, or less intuitive or, or, or you know, does it not really make a difference? Because there is a, a paradigm shift, if you will, in using you know, key, key value as against relational. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think you do need to start thinking slightly differently um, with a relational database and, um, and in, you know, other types of databases. The query is you go to. With a key value store, the key is where you go to. And you have to sort of think, um, can I get directly to that key as quickly as possible? Can I form it from what the query content is? Um, yeah, I, I haven't really thought how to explain to someone who is only ever in relational databases how to really use a key value to its highest performance. Um, but it, it is essentially going as quickly as possible to the, the value you know is there, is, uh, is the way I always, I always think, which is the sort of, um, yeah, thinking differently, not trying to avoid a query if you can, because a query and scan is never going to be the fastest way to get to data. Right, right, okay, that's good. Food for thought. Um, yeah, so um, another question um, I've, I've got in the chat. Uh, you know, not all time series use cases are created equally. Um, I think, you know, having worked with you, you've got you know, a very particular set of uses in mind and a very you know, specific set of needs. Um, in mind. Uh, I think one thing we'd like to do at Aerospike is, you know, develop solutions. So, 
you know, sort of shrink-wrapped um, APIs um, that you know we can, we can give to people so they don't have to build their own. You know, what are your thoughts with respect to time series? Do you think that that's something that is sort of fe feasible? Would it be possible to build something generic or you know, might everybody ultimately be in a similar position to yourselves in that they probably have quite a specialized uh, sort of need for the, you know, the, 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 the time series data and therefore they have to, to do their own thing to, to make it work for them? <clears throat> I, think, I think it's possible to build a generic API. Um, thinking off the top of my head, I would, I would sort of consider maybe you need to create some special types of values so you can append easily. So that instead of um, capturing each one as a separate key and a value, you could say append this time point to this existing time set, which you can do with lists, I believe. Isn't that right? Um, you can add some to the end or a map um, rather than restating the entire time series. The solution we've got is very bespoke because we restate the entire um, chunk of data every time we re write it in rather than you know amending it and, and changing it individually. But a generic one could be possible but it would potentially need a little bit of, yeah, a little bit of skill to, to persuade its work off the shelf. But I think it should be feasible. All right. Well, maybe that'll be something we might be talking about in 2022. And so, of course, you know, we'd love you to come back. Um, yeah, I think that the final question I've got really refers to what you talked about at the, the start of um, the, the presentation. You know, Aerospike, it lets you do more. Um, so it lets you it effectively harness, you know, you know, to all intents and purposes, an infinite amount of data with, with ready access. And I guess there's two ways in which um, data can expand. People might think normally about simply adding more data and, you know, we know the world is a data-rich place, uh, but also you could, um, your time series could be denser, right? You could, you could take observations um, sort of more frequently. Um, so I wondered if you could talk about the ways in which, you know, extending along both those axes would have uh, value to geosearch. <laughs> um, <laughs> flip an answer is yes yes that is exactly what why we wanted to be able to expand easily it's um there's more variety coming um and everyone wants more and more data and the demands are there to to provide that possibly through to people to, to, to get more data the granularity if you, that gives you more accuracy you know you, you can think of sound you know if you listen to something that's been sampled at a very low frequency you don't get very good quality you get in an in understanding of the telephone call but you, you don't get the full range so having smaller granularity gives you a much more rich range of that data it shows you much more qualities that people can extract more features from and then from that would generate business value to the organization yeah and I guess there is a limit to that in that, you know, if you were to sample beyond a certain point, sampling, you just, you're just getting noise back. But do you, do you feel you've hit that point or is the room for, you know, in increasing the sampling rate, but, but continuing to reap value from that? I'm not in the position to say that people are asking for a higher granularity, whether they are finding more, uh, that use, the data is more useful. Uh, that's something the, the quantitative researchers will be able to, to answer those questions. Um, they're asking for it. So that's something which we are, we are working with them to, to deliver them that sort of data. So when they stop asking, we know we've gone too far. So. Right. Okay, and then final um, final question. Uh, and we've only got I think, a minute left. So uh, if you had to pick a feature you know, you'd like to see in the product for, for next year, what would that be? <laughs> um, I can't think of one off the top of my head of new feature. I, um, we, we'd like to put ranges on the, the get by range to limit the number of return values, but there's things, little things like that would just make this solution better. Um, but in general, um, I think just expanding its integration into the security systems is, is where we, we will be kind of persuading things to go, so. Great. Right, well, I think that wraps us up um, for today, Stephen. So thanks very much, um, particularly for dialing in slightly after hours. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's tea time um, here in the, in the UK, but uh, thanks a lot. And it's been uh, great to work with you over the past couple of years. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to present what we've used the product for.